Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. May they be in keeping with the teachings and the wisdom of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I was stunned when I heard the news. Many years ago, someone on the church staff informed me that a member of our congregation had passed away. She'd been in the hospital, but I'd visited with her just a couple of days before, and she seemed to be doing well. I immediately dropped what I was working on and drove to the hospital, hoping to share my condolences with her grieving family. When I arrived, her room was already empty, the bed made with crisp white sheets, as if she'd never been there at all. Her family was nowhere to be found. I flagged down a passing nurse and asked where they might be. Oh, they went out to lunch, she said casually. That struck me as a little odd, given that this woman had passed away less than an hour ago. They went out to lunch, I asked, a bit dumbfounded. Yeah, she replied. I heard her husband say that he had a craving for portillos. A a craving for portillos? I I repeated. At a time like this? The nurse looked a bit puzzled and then looked down at her watch. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's about lunchtime. Anyway, I've got to get back to work, she said. But if you want a visitor, we moved her to room 409. She seems to be in good spirits today. Hopefully she can go home in another day or two. Confused, I made my way to room 409 and found her sitting up in bed, watching TV, and very much alive. As it turns out, the hospital had called her house about some routine business and left a message with the housekeeper, who doesn't speak very much English. The housekeeper, somehow interpreting this as news that the woman had died, called the church, passed the message along to our staff, who shared it with me. It was all a big misunderstanding, a bad game of telephone. I was certainly grateful for a happy ending. But the story illustrates how easy it is to believe something that isn't true, how quickly we can surrender to a false narrative when it comes from a source that we trust. That is what happened during the reprehensible attack on the Capitol earlier this month. A whole lot of people bought into a story that isn't true. They must be held to account, but we would do well to understand the forces at work here. Conspiracy theories seem to be the soup du jour in America these days. Folks have long believed that The U.S. government is hiding alien secrets in Area 51, and my wife still believes in Bigfoot. But new, more dangerous ideas have been slowly permeating the mainstream of American consciousness. Foremost among these is the QAnon movement, a disparate collection of folks united in their belief that America is in the thrall of a so-called deep state, a shadow cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles that is pulling the strings of the government. Their hope lies in a mysterious figure known only as Q, working to sabotage this corrupt system from within, leaking cryptic messages on internet forums and preparing people to rise up against the deep state, much as some attempted to do this month in Washington. Now these kinds of narratives have real life consequences. As you may recall, in 2016, a well-meaning but deeply misguided man entered the Comet Ping Pong pizza parlor with an assault rifle and started firing off rounds because he'd been led to believe that there were kidnapped children in the basement, victims of a sex trafficking ring run by the political elites. 
Fortunately, at that time, no one was hurt. And last week, well, we all saw what happens when enough people succumb to mass hysteria. Movements like QAnon and Stop the Steal are tempting paths for disenfranchised folks who are desperate for something to believe in. A story in which they can be champions against the forces of evil. A story that lends meaning to a person's existence. The guy who tried to storm the pizza parlor thought he was going to be a hero. This was his moment, his purpose. Instead, now he's filled with remorse. It was never my intention to harm or frighten innocent lives, he later remarked from prison. But I realized just now how foolish and reckless my decision was. For some, religion is too ethereal to satisfy that longing for purpose. It's promises and rewards too abstract or distant. But religion pairs nicely with conspiratorial myths, blending into something that scholars call conspirituality. Conspirituality is the entanglement of religious beliefs with politically driven conspiracy theories. These religious ideas are often of the so-called New Age variety, but aspects of Christianity are often found here as well. The term first appeared, I believe, in a 2011 article in the Journal of Contemporary Religion, where the authors describe conspirituality as, quote, a rapidly growing web movement expressing an ideology fueled by political disillusionment and the popularity of alternative worldviews. Proponents believe that the best strategy for dealing with the threat of a totalitarian new world order is to act in accordance with an awakened worldview. In other words, spiritual enlightenment is equated with the unmasking of political conspiracies. But if this all seems a little abstract, a bit heady, we need look no further than what happened in Washington to see where the rubber meets the road. Jake Angeli, who calls himself the Q Shaman, among other things, was the poster child of these riots. His animal furs, face paint, and horn helmet stood out from the crowd. He is a self-proclaimed shaman, ordained minister, and spiritual healer. His social media accounts and branding materials are rife with magical thinking and the aforementioned blend of New Age religiosity with political conspiracies. He is, I believe, a gullible person, a guy who is susceptible to drawing connections where there are none and looking for meaning in all the wrong places. But as a Christian, Jake Angeli concerns me less than the folks carrying Jesus 2020 signs in Washington, and in at least one case, a giant wooden cross. In evangelical circles, Christianity has long been fused with politics in dangerous ways. Certain politicians, including the sitting president, have been treated with an almost messianic reverence. Somehow, Jesus has become entangled in the purported conspiracy to steal a presidential election. Somehow, Jesus has been co-opted, hijacked, cajoled into leading an angry mob. And some prominent evangelicals are beginning to question their role in that. Ed Stetzer, the executive director of the Billy Graham Center in Wheaton College, recently told NPR that evangelicals have to reckon with their allegiances. Part of that reckoning is, how did we get here, he asks. How were we so easily fooled by conspiracy theories? We need to make clear who we are, and our allegiance, he says, is to King Jesus not to what boasting political leader might come next. When I was much younger, before 
I had the benefit of a seminary education or really studied the Bible. I'd read a whole lot of books about biblical prophecy and the end times, stuff about how the book of Revelation was really an encrypted message about Russia and Iran, the sort of Christian nationalist tripe that painted America's political adversaries as demonic forces to be overcome in cosmic warfare. A part of me thought that Revelation might be an actual prophecy, and I was halfway convinced that the world was going to end at the end of the millennium, like so many doomsday prophets had predicted in the 90s. It's easier than you might think to fall for these kinds of narratives when you're on the fringes and looking for something to believe in and some place to belong. Jesus, I think, was also tempted to read scripture too literally, especially these texts about how the Messiah was supposed to be a king. King Jesus, as Stetzer calls him, though he doesn't mean that in a political sense. But at the time, many of Jesus' supporters did. That's what they expected of him. The Messiah was supposed to overthrow Rome violently, if necessary, and reclaim the Davidic throne. It says so right in the scriptures. You are my son. Today I have begotten you, reads the second psalm in regards to the Messiah. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. These are supposed to be God's words, but they sound an awful lot like what the devil told Jesus in the wilderness when he showed him a vast empire that he said could be his to command. All Christ has to do is succumb to that lie, take up arms, and lead an insurrection against Rome. But Jesus rejected that path. He refused to resort to violence or store up an angry mob. And in the end, he was crucified by one. Jesus refused the false narrative. He refused to be king. Someone ought to tell the people with all of those Jesus 2020 signs that he's not running for office. In Jesus' final hours, he has this fascinating conversation with Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, who asks Jesus if he really believes that he's the rightful king of Israel, the so-called king of the Jews. You say so, Jesus replies, rejecting that title. My kingdom is not of this world. I am only here to testify to the truth. Truth, Pilate sneers like the tyrant that he is. What is truth? That is the defining question of our age, friends. What is truth and what is a lie? What is fake news and propaganda and what is fact? And how can we nurture a common narrative that we can all believe in? I really don't know where we go from here as a nation. I don't know how to police the trafficking of misinformation and propaganda without curtailing First Amendment rights. I don't have those answers. But as Christians, our course is as clear as it's ever been. We follow Jesus wherever he might lead, not towards a throne built on lies, but rather towards the cross, where Jesus is crucified by an angry mob and yet cries out, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Amen.